Hey everybody, welcome to our video on non-suicidal self-injury. This is the second half of the PowerPoint that's in the module for this week. So let's get started. The first thing that we need to define is what is non-suicidal self-injury. Non-suicidal self-injury is a deliberate injury to the body that someone performs when they are not attempting to commit suicide. One of the confusing things is many people who engage in these behaviors, self-injury, also might have suicidal thoughts. The real key is that the injuries that are performed are not to end one's life. So even if they have suicidal thoughts, the injury is not supposed to end that person's life. So there is an overlap between non-suicidal self-injury and suicidality, but it's important to keep in mind that when we're talking about these injuries, we're talking about injuries that are not in an attempt to commit suicide. Um, injuries that are sustained when someone attempts to commit suicide would be suicidal self-injury and is really more of a suicidal attempt than self-injury uh, as far as what we're going to term things. You may have also heard of this called self-harm or self-mutilation. The more appropriate professional term is non-suicidal self-injury or self-injury. Now some people may use the term cutting. There's kind of two problems with the word cutting or cutters. Uh, not all non-suicidal self-injury is uh, cutting behavior. Some of it is um, wound infliction. Some of it might be superficial burns. So it's not just all cutting behavior. Also, cutting and cutters is more of insider language. So if I'm part of the group, if I'm an insider, I might use that, inform that term to refer to what I do in my identity. But if you're an outsider or a professional, it's really not a term that we would use, right? So if you're an insider, feel free to keep using that language. That's insider language. That's how um, people who are inside the behavior or who are in recovery sometimes identify themselves. But as far as the professional term, uh, it's really inappropriate for professionals to use the term cutters or cutting. So is this a disorder? Is this a diagnosis? Well, no, this is not a diagnosis. Now in the DSM, we do have an area towards the back that's um, behaviors that we're studying and disorders that we're studying to see if they make it into the next edition of the DSM. Um, so self-injury is not a diagnosis at this time. It is something that we're looking at that we might add later on. And this is the proposed criteria that we are as a professional community discussing as to whether or not we will accept this criteria and whether or not this criteria might be in a future editions. Is it a focus of clinical attention? Absolutely. It's something that many people struggle with. It's something that many people come to therapy with. So it is something that people do experience. So what counts and what doesn't count? Well, one of the things that doesn't count is any kind of injury that is part of a culturally sanctioned behavior, right? Um, I s problematically get people um, who are poorly educated in this area say to me, well, isn't tattooing a form of self-injury? No, tattooing is part of a subculture phenomenon. Um, it's also usually done for body adornment and not for psychological reasons to handle distress and trauma. So um, it also usually doesn't have the negative outcomes that we see as well. So it doesn't count. Other things that of course don't count is if the injuries are because of a behavior that is part of another mental condition. So like for example, if someone has trichotillomania, which is the repetitive pulling out of hair, that's its own condition. That's not non-suicidal self-injury. If someone uh, injures themselves because of what we call stereotypic behavior, so what it means is like if I rhythmically bang my head or rhythmically shake my arms and I hurt myself in doing that. We usually see that in um, autism spectrum disorders and sometimes around intellectual disability. It just depends. Um, but those are the mental disorders or the conditions that we usually see that behavior. That is not non-suicidal self-injury. And then the really important one on here is suicidality. Like I mentioned, if the injury is because you, that person had attempted to end their life, then that's suicidal self-injury and that's a different beast. So there's some problems with this area of research. First of all, we tend to make a very clear definition between non-suicidal self-injury and behaviors that are associated with suicide, but we do tend to find an overlap of self-injury and suicidal thoughts. So the distinction becomes less clear when we talk about real humans. There's also a great deal of barriers to research. 
Um, if you think about it, non-suicidal self-injury is still a stigmatized behavior. It's not something that people talk about a lot. And because people don't talk about it, people don't talk about it in research. So they don't always show up to our studies. Anonymous data collection can be used, but then that prevents us from doing any kind of longitudinal or follow-up. Now we do know things about non-suicidal self-injury, but we want to critique that research and recognize that there are gaps in what we know. So how common is this? Well, the easy answer to that is it depends. There's a great wide range in research between prevalence rates. That makes sense. If it's hard to research, then it's hard to research, and prevalency rates are really hard to establish when something is secretive, hidden, or stigmatized. So what I would say is this is probably more common than you think. And that's as close as we can probably get to answering that question. Some of the studies estimate that uh, women and girls are more likely to engage in self-injury behavior than men. However, as a clinician who has worked with this population, what I will tell you is I think that's an exaggeration. What I find is that my girls and my women who are clients uh, tend to do more of the slicing behaviors that we come to associate with cutting and that my male clients do more of a carving of images or words. Um, and that sometimes goes less noticed, which is problematic. So I, I would critique the gender ratios here because I don't necessarily see that in practice. So if this is not all cutting behavior, what kinds of behaviors are we talking about? Well, we can be talking about anything that cuts into the skin, but we can also be talking about superficial burns, particularly cigarette or lighter based burns. We can talk about minor puncture wounds like with uh, pins or safety pins. We can be talking about um, eraser burns or friction burns. We can this can also include just the uh, interference of wound healing, so picking at scabs, all the way up to actually um, head banging, and I don't mean like to heavy metal, but like banging the head into things on purpose, um, punching oneself, slapping oneself, um, biting oneself. So there's a whole range of behaviors. Um, only a very small amount of behaviors are the ones that we tend to see media images of. Whether or not that's because they're the most common or not, it's hard to say. Um, as the behaviors get more extreme, people tend to get much less likely to talk about them. One of the major problems that I see amongst clinicians or lay people who are not well trained on this topic is there's an assumption that where someone does these injuries on the body is a way to tell how serious that person is. There's this idea that if you harm kind of a very obvious place on the body that you see routinely or something that's not likely to cause a lot of um, long term damage like a forearm, that that's somehow less serious than if you were to cut on this part of the arm or if you were to cut in the um, hidden parts of your body like towards the panty line or underwear line or on the stomach. At the end of the day, non-suicidal self-injury is a serious behavior. It's a serious condition. It's a really big warning flag for me that there is a lot going on with that person. So it's more important to pay attention to that any behavior is serious and the location is not a good read for that. I've met plenty of people who were incredibly serious uh, about what they were doing who only cut on the forearms. The most common question I get from people about this behavior is one, doesn't that hurt? And two, why would anyone do that? So we're gonna to attempt to answer both of those. Does this hurt? That's not a really useful question for clinicians, but I can understand how students might be interested in that answer to that question. Um, does it hurt? Well, yes and no, it depends on the person. What we find is that some people uh, self-injure when they're in kind of a dissociative state and that the injury is not experienced as pain, but as experienced as a reminder that someone is alive. And so they go from being very numb and disconnected to back in their body. Some people report that yes, it's very painful and that's the purpose of why I do this is that focusing all of this ambiguous emotional pain on a clear physical pain that I can see is a, gives me a sense of control. So it really depends on the person. There's a lot of different reasons why someone might self-injure and we find that whether or not they experience or label it as painful tends to go with their reason. 
We'll talk more about these reasons in a second. This slide summarizes some of the client explanations for why they may engage in that behavior. And from this, we can kind of see that there might be certain types, uh, a typology system here. And the last one is to gain attention. I think it's really important for people to pay attention to the attention getting language. Uh, we also see this with suicidality, that people who have multiple attempts must be just trying to gain attention. That's a really problematic attitude when it comes to prevention. So first, if someone just needs attention, give them attention. It doesn't cost you anything. If someone needs attention so much that they're willing to hurt themselves for that, give them some attention. What's the worst that could happen, right? Um, but also sometimes we find, and it's a much smaller group in the clients who self-injure, do this to gain attention, but it's not like the attention seeking that you might think of like with Instagram posts or thirsty tweets or something like that. It's more the attention of, hey, I need help. Pay attention to me. Stuff is going on. Help, help, help. It's more like a cry for help than just pay attention to me. I hope that helps clarify that. So why do people self-injure? This graphic might help you to understand all of the different factors that go into why some people self-injure. First, there are our risk factors. So as you can see, there's a genetic predisposition for cognitive reactivity or high emotionality. Um, if we see any childhood abuse or maltreatment, or if the family environment is particularly critical or hostile, those are your risk factors. Now with any risk factor, you might have a risk factor but never actually develop whatever the condition is. That's true for all things that put you at risk. That's why it's at risk and not a guarantee. These just kind of set the stage. The next area are your vulnerability factors. These would then build on your risk factors. What we find is that there are intrapersonal and interpersonal factors. Remember that intra means inside the self and inter means between two people. So the intrapersonal ones are if I have uh, highly aversive cognitions and emotions or poor tolerance for distress. My interpersonal factors are if I have poor communication skills or poor, poor problem solving skills. If you have some of those vulnerability factors on top of some of those risk factors and then you experience a stress response, some kind of great deal of distress or trauma that produces some kind of unmanageable social demands or hyper arousal or under arousal, then that can lead to a situation where if you have some non-suicidal specific vulnerability factors, particularly these hypotheses that we'll talk about in a moment, that might lead to the beginning of non-suicidal self-injury. If you begin that non-suicidal self-injury, that might help you regulate whatever is the effective experience or the situational experience, thus rewarding the behavior, and then I continue to do it. So what are some other risk factors? We also find that, again, one of the major constructs that we've been studying all semester is that peace around belonging and social support. People who feel disconnected, who have a low sense of belonging, who feel uh, loneliness, or who don't perceive that they have a great deal of social support tend to be more likely to self-injure than others. I hope you've picked up on that social connectedness is key and that people need social support. Also, self-esteem and satisfaction with life tends to be a major risk factor. There are a few studies for all of these that show that these uh, can be risk factors for non-suicidal self-injury. The real common themes here are that uh, if there's a, if that person has difficulty with emotional regulation, um, that can cause, that can be a risk factor for both disordered eating, depression, uh, substance abuse and non-suicidal self-injury. That's why many of these topics are talked about in the same unit. I do that intentionally. Further risk factors can be, again, critical parenting. That goes back to that hostile environment. We also find that there's a link around serotonin, that adolescents who have a history of self-injury tend to have lower levels of serotonin. Um, as you've read from some of the articles about suicidality and some of our other topics, serotonin tends to be a major factor around several of our disorders. And then finally, that communication skills piece can go with that social pro problem solving that you saw in the original flow chart. So this slide is one of my favorites because it's really extra fascinating to me. 
What researchers have found is that they took a group of people who had a history of non-suicidal self-injury and a group of people who didn't. And then they wired something that would test how conductive their skin was when they were distressed or upset and then made them distressed and upset. And what they found is that the group that had a history of non-suicidal self-injury actually had higher skin conductivity rates. What this means is that the people who had a history of self-injury, when they felt distressed or upset or agitated, they actually felt it more. They had an increased stress response in their skin. Imagine how triggering that might be for cravings to engage in that behavior in the future. That might alert the brain to focus more on the skin, which might again cause higher cravings to engage in that behavior in people who might be trying not to. It's a problem that we find when we start working with clients to help them on the road to recovery. If you remember from that original flowchart, there's also some hypotheses as to why people self-injure. I'm not going to go into depth into all of these hypotheses, but if you have any questions about them, you can post to the FAQ board. I am going to talk about the social signaling hypothesis, however. I don't know if you've had a course that's talked about social signaling behavior, but it's the idea that a culture um, has certain behaviors that are just known unconsciously that signal for help okay um some of these you might know you know like just the waving and stuff facial gestures but this would be that i'm not choosing to do self-injury to get to alert other people but one of the reasons why i might be drawn to self-injury is because i know in the core of who i am as an unconscious knowledge that that's an extreme behavior that will signal to my pack mates that will signal to my in-group members that i'm in a great deal of distress and i need help signaling behavior is sometimes the difference between speaking hey i need help or yelling because the behavior actually greatly alerts the in-group members that you are in need of help this also goes back to the concept of symptom pool in the waters text so make sure you understand symptom pool because i find that uh, if you understand the symptom pool concept, then the signaling hypothesis also makes sense. Here are some of the other reasons as to why people might self-injure. Uh, again, I feel like you can read through the slide. If you have any questions about it, uh, reach out to me on the FAQ board. Also, there's a component of behavioral addictions because anytime that you injure the body, either intentionally or not, endorphins are released. Endorphins are your body's natural opiates. And so they are our painkillers. They feel good. And so while it's a very, very small amount, it's still an amount of endorphins. So that means that I'm getting rewarded on a psychological level by a decrease of distress and I'm getting rewarded on a biological physical level with this tiny little hit of endorphins that means the behavior gets rewarded which means it's harder to not continue to engage in the behavior one of the major camps of explanations as to why people self-injure is what's called the effective arousal camp so this also makes use of the endorphins explanation it's the idea that i experience some kind of distress i engage in the behavior the Engaging in the behavior decreases that negative affect, negative arousal, and then that rewards me to continue, right? So affect arousal tends to be just the psychological arousal, and many of us pair it with the nod to endorphins so that we realize that this is getting rewarded on a double level. The real key here is that we have research to support many of these hypotheses and that no single cause or theory explains every incident. So there's a lot of individual differences. I also like this graphic or this flowchart to help understand kind of the two camps of the distress versus the numb. So if I'm in a situation where I'm hyper stressed and I feel overwhelmed or unable to cope, those feelings become a trigger for me to then crave the behavior of self injury. And then afterwards I feel relieved or calm or more in control versus I experience a situation of dissociation. This makes me feel numb, lost, or disconnected. That then might be a trigger for me to perform self-injury, which thus makes me feel more alive or real. And then the next time I feel like a dissociative experience, again, I might just continue down this behavior because it's been rewarded. Or the next time I feel hyper-stressed, I continue down 
this side of the flow chart uh, to engage in the behavior. So I've worked with self injurers a lot because the majority of my clinical experience has been with uh, adolescents. And what I would say is that, yes, I think there are discrete typologies. Um, affect arousal tends to be the largest camp uh, in research, but I've seen all of these and all of these as explanations. So it's important for professionals or people who are really interested in studying this area to kind of look at these typologies to understand that no one theory explains all of them. The last thing I will say is that the real key here is that recovery is possible. And in your module, you have some links that are about uh, prevention, and many of them are about suicide prevention, but some of them are also useful to people who experience self-injury. One of the big ones is the semicolon project. The semicolon project was started by Amy Bluell, and I've never heard her name pronounced out loud, so I don't know if that's correct, but she started this. It's most certainly gotten much bigger since she started it. Um, you can actually read about her story through the website if you're interested, which is linked in the module. So why a semicolon? The idea behind the semicolon is that an author can put a period somewhere and end a sentence. Or that same author can use a semicolon and that semicolon continues the sentence. It's the idea that the semicolon tells us that your story isn't over. So it's usually used around people who are survivors. But the website has a lot of great resources. There are other resources on the net. And I just think it's really important for this module particularly that everyone focus on prevention, but also intervention. Because many people who you might know have a history with suicidal thoughts and non-suicidal self-injury. As long as these topics are secretive, then the people who need help might not get help. And the understanding that we need from research, but also in the professional community won't be achieved. So it's important that we start talking about these topics out in the open. With that, I'll end with a quote that's usually attributed to Winston Churchill. And that is, if you're going through hell, keep going. See you on the internet.